The message this morning comes from Romans chapter 9, verse 14 through 18. If you're using a pew Bible, that's going to be on page 1,119. Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Thank you for coming out. We we live in very interesting times. I love this time, don't you? I just love it. This, This is how, this is what, God called us to this. And he's in control. And he's called us to a moment of joy. Think about who he is and the wonder of God. You know, I'm not on Facebook. (laughs) No one seems to care. (laughs) So I'm not on Facebook. I think, I think if they had uh, something else out there, I don't know what it would be on. An uh, elbow book or something. Um, a shin book. I don't know. But I, I, wanna, I want you to just to pick up and say, yeah, you know, we must pray. We pray for our leaders that they might be saved. We regard the authority. But when that authority denies God, we do not compromise. In the Word of God, in the book of Acts, in chapter 4, the apostles were charged not to speak in the name of Jesus by the authorities. And what did they say in response? But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. We honor authority yet without compromise. And that's where the church must be. And that's where we are now. How how delightful. We thank God for all that he's doing. We will stand firm. We will not budge one iota. We will love our enemies. We will trust God because all of this that is upon us is from him. And he wants the best for us. There's one thing we must get clear is to, we must reject this idea that somehow um, God needs to be fair like we're fair. A couple of words in the text. If you look at Romans 9, 14 through 18, Paul has just said this. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I've hated. What a hard phrase. What a, what a hard sentence. What a hard declaration. But we have to understand what justice means. It means God always does right. Genesis 18.25, the last part of that verse. God always does what is right and just. The word mercy means undeserved goodness to those in, in misery. It is voluntary by God. So the passage highlights mercy and is concerned with God's freedom and not ours. It's concerned with God's freedom and not ours. We have to get that straight in order to understand what Paul is saying. The Apostle Paul deals with so this truth that he's presenting here today is a clear picture of God, but it is hard for us to understand because we are inundated with this doctrine of fairness, meaning God has to give the same to everybody because we say so. You have to spread the grace around. No, he doesn't. 
there goes the train. <clears throat> Never fails. It's, yep, 11.37, there it goes, bringing molasses to the local town. Now we're going to pray. Let's talk about, today we're going to talk about mercy. We're going to talk about justice. And we're going to talk about God and how free and wonderful he is. Let, let's pray. Father, would you show us today how big you are and how dependent we are on you as the people of God. Would you help us to grow in our love for you and our love for our enemies and our love for those who are round about, who don't know you. Let us desire to bring the gospel even, even if there's trouble for bringing it. And Lord, we once again lift up our brothers and sisters in persecution. And we ask that you would bless them this day. Bless them, Lord. We pray uh, for Reverend Umaru and for Ladi and, and uh, Alta and Yakubu and uh, Kogo and many others who are under persecution. Bless them and encourage their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We live in a culture of fairness. Our leaders for whom we pray go about the country and talk about being fair. It must, we must be fair. We, 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 everybody has to pay their fair share. We hear this. We hear others talking about, well, let's just stop saying to people um, that they can't marry. Let's let men marry men and women marry women. It's only fair. It's only fair. And then you have people within the visible church, and the visible church consists of real believers and non-believers together. And the visible church in America has many denominations, some of them more um, uh, orthodox than others. But the visible church, within it, you hear things like this, and I've heard them. If Mahatma Gandhi is not in heaven, then God is not fair. How about this statement in the modern era? I don't think God is fair because he said in Romans 9, 13, as is written, Jacob I love, but Esau is, I've hated. And how can he be fair since Jacob and Esau hadn't done anything right and wrong yet? They weren't even born yet. And he's not basing his, his, uh, his, his decision on favoring one over the other on works. They haven't had a chance to work and do anything. So that's not fair. They should have a chance to work. But yeah, he's not fair. God isn't fair. Without consideration of works before they're even born, what is God thinking? Now, Paul heard similar things in his day, and obviously these are the people, these are the fairness people in his day who were saying, well, God isn't fair. God has to be fair. He has to be fair to everybody. Give them the same load here. And, um, <clears throat> and he's saying no. And then there were those who were saying, wait a minute, uh, we Jews are the people of God, and uh, God, God deals with all of us in and, and, you know, the same way, and we're all, all his people. Who are you, Paul, to say that that's not so? And Paul said, now, wait a minute. God is not a God of fairness. He's a God of justice. So... He says in verse 14, notice this, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. He's emphatic. Paul says, no, God is just. He is not unjust. There were people who were saying, well, you know, God's unfair. Uh, if you're saying, Paul, that some people of Israel are not people of God and others are, then God's unjust. And then the general crowd, ha, he ought to be spreading his grace all over the place. And Paul is just saying, no, that's not, uh, that's not true. So Paul is going to tell us today, he's going to tell us who God is. He's going to say, okay, God is a God of justice. God is not a God of fairness. This is a culture of fairness. Come on, let's be fair. Let's be fair. Well, that isn't the God of the Bible. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so 
So what, what Paul does here today, if you'll notice verse, verse 15 and then 17, there are two words, four and four, same word, four, four. Paul is giving two reasons why God is just. So the Bible tells us today who God is through Paul's writing under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And more particularly, why, is, why does Paul believe that God is just? What are his reasons for saying that God is just? Uh, he doesn't seem to be fair, and Paul says, no, he's not fair, he's just. It's two different things. And so he's going to express the reasons why God is just, even though he said, Jake, Jacob I've loved, but Esau I've hated. It's not about fairness. So today the question is, why, in Paul's opinion, by the Holy Spirit, in the opinion of the Word of God, why is God just? Why do we still say that God is just in spite of the fact that Romans 9, 13 exists? Why do we say that God is just? Or you could say, what does the Bible mean when it says that God is just? Let's give the two reasons, and then we'll apply them. What does the Bible mean when it says that God is just? Why, is, why does Paul say that, Paul is, that, that, that God is just given what he says about Jacob and Esau? Okay, here are a couple of reasons. God is just because, look at this verse in verse 15. For he says to Moses, that is God, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Now watch this. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. We'll unpack that. God is just because he shows mercy. God is just because he shows mercy. Now, mercy doesn't equal justice, but just because God is just, he is merciful. Mercy comes out of justice. It is goodness to those who are in misery. That's God is just because he shows mercy or goodness to those who are in misery. Paul rejects the notion that God is unjust. Those who stamp their feet and say, God is unfair. Why are you so unfair, God? Look at my circumstances, blah, blah, blah. And Paul says to that, no, God is just. Because he shows mercy. In Exodus 33, well, what Paul quotes here is Exodus 33, 19. If you'll go there. Exodus 33, 19. I want to show you this per passage. We have covered this on Wednesday night already. In the context of Moses interceding for the people of God, <clears throat> we'll read this. And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. He says this to Moses. Moses said, Please, show me your glory. And he said, I will make... All my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. There's the quote. It comes out of Exodus. Moses is interceding. This is at that point where... The covenant, just about the covenant, is being removed, renewed. It is after the golden calf incident, the great sin of the people of God. And you see God declaring his graciousness and his mercy. Mercy is a kind of grace, you could say. So Paul quotes Exodus. No human being deserves mercy. That's what he's saying. We know that already from Romans 9, 10 through 13. We know that, the, the Jacob and Esau statement. That is a truism. No human being deserves mercy. Romans 9, 15. I will have mercy or kindness to those 
who are in misery. And I will have mercy in whom I have mercy. I will have compassion in whom I have compassion. God, God voluntarily gives mercy. He's not obligated to be merciful. He obligates himself to be just. That is, he always does what is right. But get this, he's not obligated to be merciful, although he is. God acts in compassion and mercy toward anyone he so chooses. God's freedom is in, 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 the, in the picture here. God's freedom. He freely chooses whom to bless with mercy. He's not bound to be merciful. Esau and Jacob don't have, didn't have a claim on God. God showed mercy where mercy was needed. And he, he showed the lack of mercy where that was needed. So it's not that God is bound by anybody. Get this, no human being deserves mercy. He says, so then it depends not on human will or exertion. It doesn't depend on what we demand, and it doesn't depend on our works. What does it depend on then? It depends on this, but on God who has mercy. Because God is just, he is merciful. That's Paul's argument to the people who say, wait a minute, we're of Israel. We deserve mercy from God all the time, no matter what we do. And he says, no, you don't understand it. The justice of God involves this. He's merciful, but to those whom he chooses to be merciful to. And he's not obligated to be so. It's not human choice and works that force God's hand to be merciful. It is God alone. If you look at the book of John, I love this passage. There's so many of them. But I, and we'll go to the book of Psalms. God is, his, <clears throat> his hand is not twisted. His arm isn't put behind his back by our human will. John. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 12. Go back to verse 11. He came to his own and his, and his own people. He did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave right to become children of God. Listen to this. Who were born... Not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. God. So, nobody, a person is saved not because of what they do or because of what they deserve. It is because he and she has been shown mercy by God alone. That's why. And this is important for us. What does this passage teach us? Well, it tells us about who God is. God isn't fair. He's just. And when he's just, he's obligated to be just. He'll always do what is right. But he's not obligated to be merciful. Yet he chooses to be merciful. But he is not going to spread the mercy around. He chooses whom, to whom he will be merciful. If a person is saved, he or she is saved because mercy was shown, not because of works. Another great passage is Psalm 119, verse 32. Psalm 119, verse 32, we see in this passage, let me just quickly read that to you. Psalm 119, verse 32, I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. This is not exertion. Faith is not a matter of human exertion. It is God. So this is the point that Paul brings to those who want God to, to be somebody 
who just does, he is such a fair guy, he treats everybody fairly. Well, he's not fair, he's just, and that's infinitely greater. And Paul's argument is, he is just in that he's merciful. And when he's merciful, he chooses to be merciful and good to those who are in misery according to his will. So that's the first thing. Why is it? You know, Paul argues that, uh, that, that, that God is just, but why does the Bible say that God is just? What are the reasons that Paul uses to back up his statement that God is just? He's not fair, but he's just. What are the reasons? The first one is that he shows mercy. Justice brings mercy, yet he's not obligated to be so. Here's the application. If we truly understand this and believe it, as believers, we say this, thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place. Because without the mercy of God, I would get what I deserved. I would get full justice, and that is hell. I deserved hell. I deserve it. But because of the mercy of God, I get heaven. And that is something for which we must rejoice. And I think that is the impetus why our persecuted church, this man named Bochan. Bochan, you saw him going into prison. You saw him being beaten. You saw him uh, being uh, mistreated. And what did he want more than food? What did he want more than that? His Bible. He wanted Christ above all else because he realizes that salvation didn't come because he strove. Salvation came by the mercy of God. And for that, he praises God. The persecuted church gets it rightly. And even if we are persecuted in the days ahead, big deal. We have been shown mercy. And as we have been challenged today, pray for our leaders. Pray for them that they be saved if they are unconverted. What a great prayer. Save them, Lord. And even if they should beat on me, I must love them enough to keep on praying. I won't obey the error. No, sir. I will keep preaching and teaching the, the word of God. And you will stand, and I know you will as a core group of believers. You'll stand, and you won't buckle because Christ is with you. What a time of great joy. What a time of joy. The more we come to understand this truth, the larger God will become in our lives. God will be huge, I'll be small, and all is well. The church will be stronger. When the, when, when the system says your salvation isn't fair, it isn't fair. Everybody's got to go to heaven or it isn't fair. The train has to be full. No, it does not. That's up to God. All we have to do is preach and teach the Word of God. That's all we're called to do, and we do it even if people beat on us. I mean, look at the example of the people overseas in the countries where they're persecuted. There are clinics where Nigerian Christians have clinics where they, they treat Muslims, and they treat them with, with regard and love them into the kingdom to the glory of God. Because they, I think they do that because they know they've been shown mercy. Oh God, have mercy on those who hate us just as you've shown mercy to me. The second thing, okay, what is Paul's argument? Why is God just? Paul says because he shows mercy. But another thing, he brings judgment. And we'll make this very brief. He brings judgment. Look at the last part here. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Verse 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh. Notice he says the scripture says to Pharaoh. When God speaks, it's scripture. That's it. This is the word of God. It's reliable. It's true. He brings judgment. Notice. The scripture says to Pharaoh. This is the king of Egypt. Pharaoh. For this very purpose, I have raised you up. So it's the plan of God to raise up Pharaoh. So Pharaoh may think, 
Pharaoh, you'll see the Pharaohs thought that they were deity on her about the time that, and they were nice guys. Can you imagine? Hi, I'm a god. You are? Yeah, I'm a god. Oh, good for you. How did you get there? Funny thing is, and not so funny thing is, many of us in the West think we are too, by virtue of the way how we treat God's word and um, how we substitute other things for the treasure that is Christ. Anyway, you have this Pharaoh guy, and he's the king, and God says, <laughs> I've raised you up. Oh, for what was the purpose then? I raised you up to show my power in you, and that <clears throat> my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. So what am I saying? What's, what's Paul saying? What's he driving at? He says the justice of God is true, and I'll tell you why it's true. Because he, has, he shows mercy, but another thing is he brings judgment. Hardness of heart. God hardened Pharaoh, and then later on you see Pharaoh hardening his own heart. The power of God that liberated Israel also judged Pharaoh and judged Egypt. He judged Pharaoh, and he raised him up for that. The purpose of Pharaoh's appearing in history was that God might be shown almighty. Whoa. Boy, that's not fair. That's not fair at all. What are you doing with that? This comes from Exodus 15, 14 through 15, and you'll see that in that song, Exodus 15, the great song, 14 through 15, that God raised up Pharaoh so that his name might be glorified. And guess what? The hearts of the nations were melted when they heard about the Exodus. In the book of Joshua, you and I, we saw together that God was glorified among the nations when they heard about the Exodus. You know what? God brings judgment because he is just. But look at how his justice extends. He gives pause to the nations who look on when he acts with might. When he acts with might, the nations look on and they shake. Oh my goodness. God God's greatness is shown. Even the lost who observe his work and his greatness are brought to pause. Judgment is a part of his justice. And he chooses when to bring that judgment and not to. Could it be that because of the great sins of our land, the great sins of murdering 50 million babies, the great sin of, of denying God in every locale in the public square. Could it be that because of the church, the visible church, not the real church, but the visible church desiring to get customers changes the gospel? Could it be that our lack of voice on truth could it be that our willingness to sacrifice and, and compromise so that we might have more things, personal peace and affluence, things, things, and more things, and delightful time to enjoy them all? Could it be that God is judging our nation right now? Could it be that uh, right now a delusion is, is upon this nation? Is God moving in judgment? And if he is, take heart. Because while he removed, whilst he brought judgment on Pharaoh in Egypt, he brought his people, he brought his people out. He rescues his people even in the moments of judgment. Our rescue is heaven. And he rescues his people even though he judges. And at the same time, he tells the nations, I am God, I'm over all. You will bow to me, and they are brought to pause. Could that be what we're seeing unfolding? It might be. And if it is, thank God, he brings judgment and hardness of heart. This is where people, 
you, you shake your head and you think, why? Why are you worshiping things when you have God? Why? Why are you, you have a whole life full of stuff and option, and yet Christ is supposed to be our first treasure? Why? Well, God will show us why. Here's what we might do for application. God is so great that he even you know, those, uses those things that oppose him to serve his purposes. He even uses things that are opposed to him to serve his purposes, so never get upset. <laughs> Let's not get upset. Let's get closer to Christ. What a wonderful opportunity. God is calling the church in the West to revival, to a mission of love and service and delight to a mission that is, is beyond what we've done before. Maybe he's saying, I'm going to revive you, but it'll be some struggles, but we'll revive you. I hope so. Revive us, Lord, so we will worship you in spirit and in truth and not any other way. Never despair. Even when folly seems to be in charge, God is the one who is overall. He's raising up this moment so that his name might be glorified. Let's take heart. Take joy from that. Yeah. We have the chance to proclaim Christ. I have the chance. You have the chance to tell people about Jesus. And they might even slap you in the head. It might do me some good. And it might just quicken me a little bit. And I say, thank you, God, for giving me the privilege to struggle in your name and for your glory. So that's it. What does the Bible mean when it says that God is just? What is Paul's argument supporting? Why is God just? What are his, what are his reasons for supporting the fact that God is just? Well, there are a couple of them. And it may seem strange to us, but not to him. He shows mercy and he brings judgment. He doesn't have to show mercy, but he does. He's just. And does he, does he punish sin? Yeah, he does. And at the same time, he's rescuing his people. He proclaims his name to the nations, and they're brought to pause. What a just God that is. No, he's not fair. He's just. I'd rather him to be fair. I think this is a time of great renewal. God is in charge. Let's pray that he would revive his church. Maybe this is the time we need it so desperately. Have enough with uh, seeker sensitivity. Enough of that nonsense. Let's get back to the real gospel. Let, let's go, you know, worship. Here's what we're all to be about. We're to be about word, prayer, worship, fellowship, and witness, local and abroad. That's what we're supposed to be about. Maybe God will renew us. Maybe this little fellowship of pastors locally will actually say to one another, we really love each other, and, and let's help each other's churches, and let's, let's preach the gospel we've never preached it before, and let's ask God to win the whole community uh, for his glory. Wouldn't that be great? And, and <laughs> to see people raised up in the name of Jesus. That's what we're all about. Let's pray. Pray for leaders who don't know Christ that they'd be saved. Those who have no Jesus, and they're, you know, they're out there doing their stuff. And we know that. But let's pray for them. You need Christ. Where is the Moses to go into Pharaoh and say, um, listen, you know, you're talking this way. What a bunch of nonsense. You need Jesus. And uh, you may throw me out and put me in prison, but you, you really, really need Christ. Mm-hmm. Where's that? May God raise up the church. So the glory of God, the gospel increases when we embrace the truth that we have no claim on God. We're utterly dependent on him. God's glory increases. We have it the other way around as we have over the years. We're depending on ourselves, our own money, our own resources. Hey, listen, government's going to get that anyway. Might as well give it to the church. <laughs> what do you want? Caesar to have it or Christ? Render to Caesar, but also render to Christ. Well, that's another thing. We're not going to get into it today. We don't have time. But it is intriguing. The church in America right now, uh, uh, unless you're in a jumped up one, a churkus, you're really struggling. And um, isn't it interesting that the amount of money given per capita in the Depression is greater than it was in the last 10 years? <laughs> and more. 
Whoa, we really love God. Anyway, what does the Bible mean when it says that God is just? God is just because he shows mercy and he brings judgment. The glory of the gospel increases when we say, you are on the throne and I'm not. That's when God gets big and we get small. Now, here's the question for all of us to self-examine. Do we believe that God must let me into heaven because he's fair and you know, I've done a lot of good things? Do you believe that he must pay attention to my good works? Then you're likely lost and need to repent and trust in Jesus. I don't need to blow my horn. There's nothing to say. I don't let God blow the horns. Let him blow the horns. We don't need any more of this self-promotion. Let God do it. Do we believe that God must let us into heaven because we've just so doggone good? Then we've missed the boat. This is the issue. Repent and trust in Jesus. If we believe in fairness, we don't know God. He's just. He shows mercy, and he also brings judgment. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God from Genesis through Revelation. Let's ask God to show himself more and more, and may our love for him increase. Pray for our enemies, love them. Show them Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blessedness that we have to be alive at this very moment. What an exciting time. What an exciting time. Here we have uh, an opportunity now to proclaim the gospel of Jesus broadly, with, a, with passion, with expectation. Lord, would you help us? Would you help us in this? God, you are just. You show mercy. You bring judgment. But you do it all to your honor and glory. You have saved us by your mercy. Let us, let us celebrate you and also show mercy by telling others about Christ. Lord, let us be merciful. Help us too, Lord, to, to be... Uh, Folks who, who don't call evil good and good evil, but who call evil evil and good good and, and show the truth to many. Let us be willing to take the beating for Christ if it be your will. And let us do it to your honor. And for those who have no Christ, would you move this day in their hearts that they might repent, turn away from sin and trust in Jesus Christ who died on the cross and rose up from the dead. Would you so move this day? O oh Lord, have mercy. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.